Well, thank you very much for the introduction. I, I didn't mean to say that, but now I have to say it, right? The reverse. <laughs> I met Tatiana a long time ago when I was a graduate student. She came to give a seminar talk at MIT. And at the, at the end of the talk, I thought, when I grow up, I want to be like that. <laughs> so, and, I, and I told her from the very beginning, so she knows. And OK, in any case, well, uh, thank you very much, Tatiana and, for, and Totti, for the invitation. Um, and uh, so today, I would like to talk about uh, viscosity approach to variational problems. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to see so many young faces in the audience. Uh, and that means that I'll try to keep at least the first half of the talk comprehensible to a young audience. I'll try my best, but stop me and ask questions if I go too fast. Um, uh, also, I tried a different approach myself. I am, uh, I hand, the, the notes are, the, the slides are handwritten. I thought my uh, handwriting would be much better than it really is, apparently. So, you know, but Tatiana promised to give me feedback on my handwriting. Yes. <laughs> so, in any case, so um, I'll start with uh, something familiar to everybody here, which is Laplace's equation to put things into context, uh, and I it works. <laughs> so. Um, I, I suppose we all are familiar with uh, uh, harmonic functions, which are uh, C2 functions, which satisfy um, this Laplace equation in a pointwise sense. So if you take the sum of all pure second derivatives, that has to give you zero. And this equation has to be satisfied in a bounded domain of Rn. And for Welcome. <laughs> you can come in. We didn't go much farther than the Laplace equation. <laughs> and you can always think in my talk that this domain is the unit ball, because everything that I say concerns the behavior of the function inside the domain. So I'm not really concerned about the actual shape of the domain and boundary values and so on. And uh, so I would say that one of the most important properties of harmonic function that we teach you in undergraduate classes is the maximum principle. And uh, it tells you that if your harmonic function is continuous up to the boundary and is non negative on the boundary, then it has to be non negative also inside, which is pretty amazing. Um, and what I want to do is I want to show you two different proofs of uh, this fact, which you probably have seen already, are the proofs that we give in a regular undergraduate PDE course. But from my point of view, let's say one proof is what stays behind the notion of viscosity solutions to Laplace's equation. And the other proof is what support the notion of uh, uh, variational or weak solutions to Laplace's equation. So I want to show you both. And that should explain somehow the title of my talk, that I want to consider both viscosity approaches and the variational approaches to elliptic equations. So I'll start with the, the first proof. Uh, and that's something, again, it's a calculus proof. Basically, um, what do I want to prove? I want to prove that my function doesn't have an interior minimum. It has to have a minimum because it's continuous up to the boundary. And I don't want it to have an interior minimum because if the minimum is on the boundary and the function is positive on the boundary, then it's going to be positive everywhere. Now, at an interior mi minimum, here is my, let's see, OK, at an interior minimum, a smooth function will have a non-negative action. And so also the Laplace has to be greater or equal than 0 at an interior minimum. So if I were to know that the Laplace of u is strictly negative, I would be done. I could conclude that you cannot have an interior minimum. Now, I don't know that. I know that the Laplace of u is equal to 0. But I can easily remedy that. So I can take away something from you, a small quadratic polynomial, this epsilon <coughs> for me to choose. And so I can make this barrier v, I'm going to call this a barrier, which has Laplace strictly smaller than 0, right? So it cannot have, because of what I told you before, cannot have an interior minimum. It has to have a minimum on the boundary, OK? But the function u is on top of the function v, because the function v is u minus something, minus something positive. So the function u is on top 
of the values of v on the boundary, which is u on the boundary minus something, and u on the boundary is greater or equal than zero. So this means that my function is bigger than minus a constant epsilon for every epsilon. I let epsilon go to zero and I obtain what I wanted, that u is greater or equal than zero. So this is my first proof. And my first proof is really just concerned with the value of the function at one point. On the other hand, here is my second proof. My second proof takes advantage of the variational structure of the Laplace. So I'm going to write the Laplace of u as the divergence of the gradient of u. So saying the Laplace of u is zero, it's equivalent to saying by integration by parts, if I integrate times a test function phi, which is compact, uh, compactly supported in omega, then I must have gradient of u dot gradient of phi integrates to zero. Okay? So my job is just to take the right test function, sort of to violate the possibility that u is not, not greater or equal than zero. And so I'm going to choose as a test function u minus, the minimum between u and zero. I'm going to plug it inside this equation, and what I obtain is that the integral of a quantity which is greater or equal than zero has to be zero. So that quantity should be zero. So the gradient of u minus should be zero. u minus should be constant. But I already know that on the boundary u minus is zero because u is greater or equal than zero. So u minus has to be zero everywhere, which means u is greater or equal than zero. Now, if you were very picky, you would tell me that the function that I'm picking is not really a C infinity function, but that's something that can be taken care of. That's just by approximation, so we shouldn't worry. Philosophically, this is really the proof. Okay? So this is really, so this variational proof based on integration by parts really cares about you on the full of omega, not just at one point, right? And so, let's see what I want to tell you next is that, well, I gave you the proof for Laplace equation, but we can think that these two proofs can be easily extended to more general elliptic operators. So what do I mean by elliptic operators? So if I have a matrix A, which is comparable to the identity, so it's bounded below and above by a multiple of the identity with these two constants, which we typically call the ellipticity constants, then the first proof I can just up to changing that quadratic polynomial, I can make it work also for equation in non-divergence form, equations like trace of a d square of u equal to zero, okay? While the second proof really can be extended to equation in divergence form, equation of the form divergence of a gradient of u equals zero, okay? So the first proof is what's going to inspire my definition, my notion of viscosity solution for <coughs> uniform and elliptic equations, and the second proof will inspire the notion of weak solution. Now, once again, you could tell me that if the matrix A is smooth enough, I can open this up, I can compute the divergence, and this equation becomes an equation in non-divergence form, right? So I could somehow say that the first proof is a little bit more general than the second proof? Well, I would be cheating because what I really want to do in the future is I do not want to have coefficients which are smooth and for which I can open up this divergence. And also, if I want to deal with systems, then I really cannot say that the first proof is stronger than the second. But that's a different, um, that's a different consideration. In any case, let's focus on the first notion that I want to introduce, that is the notion of viscosity solution. So what does it mean that a function u is a viscosity solution? You can think Laplace equation for this L. It's easier for me to say. It's a viscosity solution to Laplace's equation. So I'm just writing down the notion of subsolution, and then you can come up with the notion of supersolution yourself once that I write this. Um, and then anything which is both a subsolution and a supersolution is automatically a solution. So my notion, which should resemble what happened a little bit in the first proof, is that if I have a continuous function, so my function just has to be continuous, and then I take a point x0 where the function u has on top a function phi which is smooth, is c2, and the two touch at the point x0, they coincide at the point x0, then, I don't know about you, but the Laplace of phi 
has to be greater or equal than zero okay so it's like what i'm asking i would like to ask for you i can't you doesn't have two derivatives i will ask it of the function phi okay and so i have a picture here which shows exactly what has to happen at points where i have a smooth function touching my u by above and the orange thing here is your definition of super solution i have something touching the function u by below and at that point at the touching point the l of psi has to be smaller or equal than zero okay so this is my notion of viscosity solution which once again only requires your function u to be continuous now if I want to write down the notion of weak solution uh, or what I said variational solution then I have to integrate by parts and again what does it mean that L of u is greater or equal than zero by integration by parts I multiply this by a function which is greater or equal than zero and I integrate by by parts and this is the equation that has to be the integral equation that has to be satisfied the beauty of this equation is that somehow there are no more second derivatives so it's almost like I went from a second order equation to a first order equation. So I must, I'm gaining quite a lot. Moreover, I don't really need to write this for functions which are C1, for functions that have an actual derivative. I can only have functions with weak derivatives. This would still make sense. So I can write this definition for a function in a Sobolev space. Okay, and I can make sense of this for test function in the correct Sobolev space. I mean, so this is a really weak, that's why weak, because we are thinking of functions with weak derivatives. Okay, so these are the two um, definitions of, they are both weak solutions, but typically we refer to the integration by parts uh, solutions as weak solutions. Yes. So this is in my slide here is there there you go okay so if i want to write the definition for something a bit more general so i can think of operators like this or i can think of operators like this okay and for weak solutions really i have to have something in divergence form so that i can apply the divergence theorem and integrate by parts so i'm gonna go now okay so now is my big question I have done, so what, what, what did I do? What did I achieve? I have solutions to a PDE which don't even have two derivatives, right? But now I'm wondering if somehow the notion that I have introduced is good enough so that automatically is going to force my viscosity or weak solution to be classical, to have two derivatives. So this is the question of regularity for um, partial differential equations. And in principle, the answer doesn't have to be a yes. So if you think about the, the picture that I had before with the viscosity solution, I'll draw it here. I was a little bit lazy because I did a function u which was very smooth, but I don't have to do that. I could have had, I could do something like this. I can have a situation like this with the cusp and my definition of viscosity solution doesn't care because at that point say i can never touch with something smooth by below big deal i don't have to check the definition at that particular point the definition only has to be satisfied at points where there is a touching happening so in principle the notion of viscosity solution and weak solution should accommodate for solutions to per to elliptic equations which have singularities which maybe solutions which come from geometric problems like you're learning about and then in that case what you want to study you want to understand what type of singularities how many singularities and maybe what's the best i can do what is the optimal regularity so those are the type of questions that we want to address in general for the regularity theory okay so now um i want to tell you what i believe is in my opinion basically the, the the most fundamental tool to understand the regularity of solutions to elliptic equation which is harnack inequality okay so and, and again whenever i write the operator l here i'm thinking uh, you can think laplace i mean don't bother you can think laplace okay so again i mean as we know from our um, 
uh, PDE classes, even undergraduate PDE classes, what does Harnack inequality tell us? It tells us that if I have a non-negative solution to my equation, then say in the ball B1, here I'm writing really B1, then if I go in half the ball, the values of the functions are all comparable. Okay? The supremum and the infimum are comparable. With the constant C, that's the crucial thing, that if this operator L is a uniformly elliptic operator, only depends on little lambda and capital lambda and nothing else. Okay? And so in some sense, this is again some sort of maximum principle. This is what we say is a quantified version of the maximum principle. You can think of the strong maximum principle. The strong maximum principle tells you that if your function has an interior maximum or minimum, really it has to be constant. And somehow Arnack inequality tells you if the function u is very, very, very small, I mean at one point, then really it has to be small because also the supremum has to be small. So that's why I say this is some sort of quantified version of the maximum principle. So now the question is, what does this have to do with the function u being regular, being smooth? Okay? And so I claim that if we have an, something like this, we can obtain that the function u has to be holder continuous, Okay, with a uniform modulus of continu continuity, sorry, which means a modulus of continuity that depends only on little lambda and capital lambda. Okay, so let me show you how from Harnack inequality I obtain the modulus of continuity, the holder modulus of continuity for a solution to, oops, oops sorry, for, I go, I'm not very good with technology, okay. There we go, okay, and hold the modulus of continuity for my function u. And I know that you might be thinking, okay, what, uh, I mean, the function u, you can think of it already as being smooth. That's not what matters. What matters is that I want a control on the holder norm that does not depend on you. Okay, so in the computations, it doesn't matter if, for instance, here I'm giving you a proof in which I write if u is 0 is greater or equal than 0. So I'm already thinking that the function is continuous, right? So I'm, but it's okay. The important thing is that whatever constant I get out of this argument only depends on dimension and then little lambda capital lambda. Okay, so here is my argument. So I have my solution with a bounded oscillation, say that u is between minus a half and a half, okay? And then I look at the center of the ball and I see what happens at the center of the ball. If u of zero is greater or equal than zero, then I'm going to work with the function u plus one half, which is a non-negative solution to our equation, for which Harnack inequality holds. But at the center, this non-negative solution separates a little bit, is bigger than one half, which means that also the full function has to be bigger than one half by Harnack inequality. So I started with a u which was only bigger than minus one half, and now I have gained a little bit. By going a little bit inside the domain, I've gained that u is bigger than minus one half plus a constant. Okay? So I have here a picture. And so the green thingy here, sorry, I keep pressing the arrow instead of the laser, okay, here it is. The green thing here is the graph of u. As you can see, if I am outside b one half, I'm allowed to go below minus one half plus c. But the moment I step in, I can't. I have to separate better, okay? So I have a gain in the oscillation of the function. And of course, if I have the other situation happening, if I start with a u of 0 which is smaller than 0, then I'm going to work with the other scenario, with the other function, because I have that u is between minus 1 half and 1 half, so I'm going to work with 1 half minus u, and I'm going to gain from the top instead of gaining from the bottom. So I have to separate a little bit more from the top. Again, the green function cannot the function of color green, I shouldn't use the word green function, it's when I go, <laughs> when I go inside v1 half, it's really a little separated a bit better, and so I have a gain in the oscillation. No matter what, I have a gain in the oscillation. What do I do with this gain in the oscillation? I use the other tool, so I said the maximum principle is probably one of the, is the most important tool we have in elliptic equation. I'm giving you the second one now, which is rescaling. Okay, so I have an information in the ball of 
radius one half, where the oscillation of my function was smaller than one minus c, I'm going to rescale that to the unit ball, okay? And this is still a solution to my equation. So here is my rescaling of one half. I also divide it by one minus c, so that I put myself precisely in the same situation as before with a function nu tilde, which has oscillation bounded by one, and it's a solution to my equation. So I just at the exact same conclusion, the oscillation has to be smaller than 1 minus c. Okay? So what? Well, now I unravel my rescaling and I find that in the ball of radius a quarter, I have an oscillation bounded by 1 minus c to the power 2. And now you can see where I'm going because I can repeat this forever. I can go on forever and ever. And so in every dyadic ball, I get a control of the oscillation with u minus c to the power k for every k. So I've got my modulus of continuity, my older modulus of continuity at the origin. And now you say, why? Well, you did it at the origin. Well, I'm just, instead of looking at zero, I'm going to look at any point in the ball b1 half. I have to make sure that when I go in the ball b1 half, I'm still in b1. So everywhere in b1 half, I can do this game. I can play this game. And I get my bound on the older norm of my solution to the elliptic equation, which with a bound that depends only on the constant from Harnack inequality. Now, the beautiful thing, so this is older continuity, and you might think, Ah, all that continuity, I didn't get enough. Well, the beautiful thing is, think Laplace equation, think a linear equation. I can bootstrap this using discrete differences, for example. So this is still a solution to my equation. This one will have all the modulus of continuity. Well, this means that basically this gives me a C1 alpha estimate, gives me a holder estimate for the derivative. Okay, so if I have a linear equation, well, I have to be a little bit careful with the regularity of the coefficient, but I can bootstrap this all the way to C infinity in principle. Okay, so not only Harnack inequality gives me the first fundamental step, which is the holder continuity, not the holder continuity, but the uniform control on the holder norm, but I can also bootstrap that. Okay, okay, so now. I'll drink a little bit of water and I'll tell you the rest of the story. So this is all classic and so you might be wondering, so where is my contribution? <laughs> and uh, what does this have to do with the title of the talk, which was something of the sort viscosity uh, solution in, in, in the viscosity approach to, uh, sorry, viscosity approach to variational problems. I'm getting there. First I have to tell you something very important, that is, if you're thinking of the proof of Harnack inequality that we give you for Laplace equation in our undergraduate PDE course based on the mean value theorem, that's beautiful, not so useful, because I want a very general proof, which again gives me a constant that depends only on little lambda and capital lambda, and holds, you know, I don't want a representation formula, I don't want anything, I just so I'm very ambitious, but luckily we had people which were, oh, I forgot about this slide, sorry. I'll tell you afterwards about the, the, the people that were very ambitious and answered the question that I want to answer. First of all, why did I have this, this slide? Exactly because of what I told you about La Laplace equation. Why do I want such a general proof? Because ultimately my, my goal is not to deal with linear equation. Ultimately, my goal is to deal with what we call nonlinear equations, okay? And, uh, and so that's why I want the most general possible proof ever. And I'm not sure how familiar you guys are and the, the, the majority of the audience is with fully nonlinear equations. So I'm just giving you some examples of things that um, are important in the literature. This is one of the classical examples of fully nonlinear equations known as Bellman equation. This is the easiest case. I'm taking only two operators. I could take infinitely many, but I'm taking two operators and I'm solving the problem of the minimum between these two has to be zero. Okay? So this is a nonlinear problem in non-diverse, non-variational structure. It's a problem that comes from stochastic control and um, and 
the, the best regularity for this problem, so the solutions, viscosity, so you can think of the notion of viscosity solution for this problem, it makes sense exactly as the one that I told you before, and uh, solutions are C2 alpha regular, the optimal regularity is C2 1, you cannot do better than that, okay, for this problem. Other problems, other nonlinear problems that you can, uh, uh, that you can uh, have in your hands are coming from the calculus of variation. You might have heard some of this in, in, your, uh, uh, in your courses these days. Uh, when you're trying to minimize uh, the integral of f of gradient of uf being a convex function and among class of competitors. And one of uh, Hilbert's problems, 19th problems of Hilbert was exactly about the smoothness of solutions to uh, regular problems in the calculus of variation. Okay, and if this is too general, I'm going to put up, I mean, my favorite equation of all times, which is the minimal surface equation, when uh, your uh, um, integral is just the area functional, and uh, so solution, critical points to the area functional have to satisfy an equation, have to satisfy what's known as the Euler-Lagrange equation for your uh, problem, which is a divergence type equation. Okay. And it's a nonlinear problem. And even if you try to pass the divergence, what you get is an equation in non-divergence form, but the coefficients of the equation depend on the gradient. So it's an ugly <laughs> equation if you want. And in fact, it's only uniformly elliptic once you know that your solution is Lipschitz. So it's rather complicated, but Lipschitz continuity actually in most of these problems can be obtained from the boundary data. So that's not the, the issue. The issue is what happens afterwards. Is the solution better? And this open up basically, this is one of the most beautiful regularity theory, in my opinion, in LFCPDs. Okay, so if we want to encompass all these different problems for which the notions of viscosity solution or weak solution make sense, but they are way more complicated, I don't have linearity anymore, then we need some efficient Harnack inequality. Okay? And so here, as I was telling you before, luckily there were amazing people that uh, were interested in this problem and gave us the beautiful proof of the Harnack inequality for equation in divergence <coughs> form with coefficients which are just bounded and measurable, so uniformly elliptic, that's all that you need. So this is what we teach you as the De Georgi Nash Moser uh, Harnack inequality. So it's the Georgi probably was working on this on the late 50s. I mean, there are so the Georgi was really interested in the minimal surface equation and was interested in exactly in the question that I told you before, okay, after Lipschitz, what do I get? And he wanted to get C1 alpha. And, uh, and so basically that's what he did. And Nash was looking already at the parabolic problem and Moser then gave his final contribution and really formulated the Harnack uh, inequality. So this is uh, breakthrough results of the late 50s, early 60s. And one of the tools is a variational proof, the tool uh, the crucial tool is what's known as Kachapon inequality. And it's a difficult proof if you have seen it. Uh, beautiful iteration scheme based on Kachapon inequality. For uh, the non-divergence form equation, so for fully nonlinear, we had to wait uh, much longer. So this, the proof came at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, due to Krilov and Safanov. And the crucial ingredient in this proof is what's known as Alexandrov Bakelman Pucci estimate. I don't want to put it down because it's not as friendly as the Kachapol inequality that I wrote before. Um, and when I write this, of course, you might tell me that I don't know how to make sense of this equation if the coefficients are just measurable. And you told me that viscosity solution, I have to touch with something, so I have to evaluate things at a point. Again, you can always think in your mind that these A's are uh, at least continuous as long as the estimates do not depend on the modulus of continuity. There is a way of making these things rigorous. But so finally, so here is my punchline. Um, 
Now let's join the two approaches. I mean, so I'm telling you the story for viscosity solution, the non-variational approach, the Harnack inequality, the no, uh, for fully non-linear, the Harnack inequality for divergence type equations. And so this is uh, the contribution that I wanted to tell you about and which will allow us to use some sort of viscosity technique for problems that are purely variational and it's some sort of Harnack inequality for functions that they don't even satisfy an equation in fact okay but basically have some sort of two scale behavior and up to a certain scale they satisfy when i write satisfy an equation here what i really have in mind is comparison with test functions with nice test function like the parabolas that i have on the blackboard so that's what it means the quotation mark here when i say satisfy an equation is more i should write satisfy comparison with test functions which are nice and then at the scale r0 they have some sort of density estimate they satisfy some sort of density density estimates and i will make this a little bit more precise hopefully, because I may be a bit behind schedule. But I want to give you a motivation for this. Otherwise, it seems like what problems in PDE would give rise to something which has this sort of behavior? Because if there is no example, why do you care about it, right? So before I tell you about what it means to satisfy an equation up to a certain scale, have density property up to another scale, and I want to give you some motivation for this notion of solution, which is not really a solution, okay? Um, and this is a joint work with Ovidio Salin. Okay. So here is my motivation. I'm going back to the minimal surface equation. This time I'm formulating it in a little bit of a more general setting because the equation I wrote before was for graphs. But if I want to look at things which are not graphs, then the one way of understanding a minimal surface is like the perimeter of a set Okay, so it's like the boundary of a set which minimizes, sorry, it's the boundary of a set which minimizes the perimeter. And if you're thinking, I understand that you have been exposed to the notion of perimeter already, so I will not dwell on that too much, but I have a couple of, I have a picture which says it, it says what happens in 2D. I really drew the picture for the boundary value problem. I fix the set E, I'm looking in the unit ball, and I'm looking for all sets which are outside of the unit ball look exactly like the set E. And then inside minimize the perimeter, which would be just the length. So if I wanna minimize the length, I better take the straight line between this point and this point. So I know exactly how to draw the picture in 2D. Okay, so that's the notion that I have in mind. So that's my minimal surface, is the boundary of E. And so here in the next slide, I'm telling you, it, because I was not sure that you had seen the perimeter functional, I said, well, just think everything is smooth, and this is really the area of the boundary of E, the H minus one measure of the boundary of E. Okay? So if I formulate the minimal surface equation like this, then what's the, what's the equation associated to this variational problem, right? The Euler-Lagrange equation. Well, it's going to tell you that the mean curvature of the boundary has to be zero and has to be satisfied in some sort of viscosity sense. But there is an equation associated to my variational problem. Okay? Now, suppose that I want to put it right hand side. Suppose that I want to look basically at the prescribed mean curvature, not mean curvature, zero prescribed mean curvature. So I'm going to minimize a functional which is perimeter plus this integral, the integral of f over e. And this is going to be my associated equation where you can see I have f restricted to the boundary of E. And in writing that, I'm thinking f is smooth. If f is in an LP space, I can't really make sense of this. So if f is in LP over n, I cannot write f restricted to the boundary of E. So if f is in LP over n, there is no really, there is not an equation associated to my variational problem. The problem is variational with no equation attached to it. So what do I do then? Right? Well, one slide? sure. One Always my technology. <laughs> yes. So, if I, what I do is the following I, I look at my energy E, I look, so I have the perimeter, okay, 
I apply holder inequality to my integral and here I have the normal ref in LP and then I'm integrating on the ball of radius rho because I'm writing the energy in mere rho and so when I do that I get this power okay so I give a name to this so what I do I'm pulling out a rho to the power n minus 1 the reason I'm doing that is that if you learn then something about the perimeter which maybe you will I mean you will learn that it behaves so in the ball of radius rho it behaves like rho to the n minus 1 so I'm pulling out the rho to the n minus 1, which is really a perimeter, and I'm left with the rho to the alpha, and this alpha is bigger than 0 because I'm taking p bigger than n. So for this range of p, basically my energy functional is what I call a small perturbation of the perimeter functional. Okay? And the philosophy in elliptic PDE, if you have looked at Schauder estimates for equation of uh, with AIJ, right? I mean, the philosophy is that I should be able to prove everything that I proved for the perimeter, or if not everything, most of the results that I proved for the perimeter, I should be able to prove them for this function, okay? And so this is my motivation. So if I'm looking at the last inequality here, here is the motivation for the notion of quasi-minimizers of the perimeter functional. Okay, so the property that I had before for the perimeter is now, there is this little error, okay? And so in my picture now, if I'm looking at the quasi-minimizer, I cannot force it to be a straight line. I'm here I'm taking the straight line to be the actual competitor, and the curved line, that is a quasi-minimizer. I cannot force it to be straight because I have this little error, okay? Now, uh, I brought here, yeah, oh sorry, sorry, I thought I was going too slow, good Christina, <laughs> too fast, <laughs> okay, so here is, um, I'm trying to get to the punchline, but you're right, I mean, I, I, it doesn't matter, whatever I get will be happy with whatever I can tell you, so let me not go too fast. So. Here I wrote a little bit, I mean, I, I mean the theory for, the regular theory for minimal surface is infinite, the regularity theory for quasi-minimizers is not infinite, but anyway, I mean, there are so many contributions, I cannot write down everything, I'm just telling you here like some sort of bottom line which tells you that your boundary is going to be C1 something, C1 alpha, outside a set which has Hausdorff dimensions smaller or equal than n minus 8, so for minimizers this is the regulated theory of the georgie but there are so many contribution and uh, I, I cannot list them all i mean so this is just some of the people and the beautiful contributions in the theory of minimal surfaces and quasi minimizers so the Al almgren and tamamini are really the ones that i have in mind for the theory of uh, quasi minimizers okay so our now let's go back to my harnack inequality that it was not clear uh, what I want to apply to and because I don't even have an equation. I don't have an equation here. I want to apply my Harnack inequality. So I claim that this is exactly one of those cases when I have a two-scale behavior okay, for my object. My object, bear in mind, in this particular case is not even a function, is the boundary of a set. But let's be flexible. So I could write my Harnack inequality in a very, very general setting. And so if I use my Harnack inequality, which is obtained purely by a viscosity approach, because if you remember, I was talking about a scale where I want comparison, so it's really like a viscosity Harnack inequality. If I, uh, I use it in this context, I can reprove the results, some of Angrin and Tamanini on quasi-minimizer, one of the crucial results in the regularity theory of minimal surfaces, the Georgi lemma for minimal surfaces, which is known as flatness result, which tells you this amazing thing. You can have the most horrendous boundary of your set, but it's trapped between two hyperplanes which are very close to each other. Then if you go a little bit inside, the boundary of the set is C1 alpha. Okay, so it's just like some magic happens and from flatness you obtain regularity. Okay, and this is one of the crucial for, for, for my particular proof. Yeah, my particular proof is, is based on, yeah, on, on a viscosity approach. 
not the original proof. So this is, this is not like a new result, but it gives a different variational approach because we had some applications in mind. But this is a classical example to keep in mind. Now, what do I want to tell you? Finally, I want to tell you maybe a little bit in the general picture what, uh, what it means that this function you has this two scale behavior. So I try to spell it out here, which might make it a little bit heavy to understand. So just let's look at the, at the picture. So I'm writing u is a super solution. There is no equation, but I need a terminology. So I'm saying that u is a super solution. It cannot be touched by below. And this is the crucial thing. Cannot be touched by below by what? First of all, by a paraboloid. It's fine. Also in that case, I can take paraboloid, but this is a very special family of paraboloids. And I only need this family of paraboloids, nothing else. Moreover, the touching is in a neighborhood of size R0. Typically, when you have a touching proof, you don't care about the size of the neighborhood. You just say the touching, like the one that I have in my picture on the board. I mean, I just say, I cannot touch by below with something with the wrong sign, right? I mean, which has a Laplace with the wrong sign. Touching how big a neighborhood, I don't care typically. But here, we really want that the picture here in red cannot happen because the touching would be happening in something of size R0, okay? So that's what it means to be a super solution. There is some, some other technicalities, but... And in some sense, this capital lambda, which I'm writing here and I'm saying is given, you can think of it as the ellipticity of your problem. So these are elliptic problems that we're dealing with, all the problems to which we can apply this strategy. So this is like incorporating the ellipticity of your problem. Okay? So here is the second property. The second property, which I call density estimate, cheating a little bit, but is telling you something like this. So suppose that your function C is non-negative, okay, in a ball, and at one point it drops below the value A, okay? Then I'm claiming that when you go in half the ball, then the measure of the set where u drops below a constant times a is pretty big. It's a fixed portion of the full ball. Okay? So basically, in my picture, the measure, the proportion is this green thing. Okay? The green thing is where u is below ma. The ma and I want this to be large enough, like, 75% maybe more, 80% of the whole thing, okay? So if I have this property, now what about the M? Well, the M actually in general, in reality, in all the application will depend on the lambda in reality. So lambda is really the main guy. Lambda is what incorporates the ellipticity. M will depend in fact in the applications from the lambda, okay? All right, so this, so now I think um, I have to give you some more concrete examples in which I can apply. So I claim that there is some sort of Harnack inequality for functions with this two-scale behavior, right? And so I have here some applications. I have, so the easiest application is to discrete equations, Harnack inequality for discrete equation. Oh, that's so nice of you, Betul. Thank you, I, and I will take advantage right away. So, Harnack inequality for discrete equation is known by the work of Hunju and Trudinger, um, but it's one of the first application of our results. I mean, other equations that somehow exhibit, for which solutions to this equation exhibited to scale behavior are no local equations when of order s when s is very close to 2. So with our Harnack inequality, we recover the results of Caffarelli and Silvestre for non-local equations. Probably we can apply them to what's known as non-local minimal surfaces. I don't expect everybody to be familiar with non-local equations, so I will avoid that particular example. Homogenization and, of course, quasi-minimizers that I already mentioned before. So what I would like to do, because the simplest model is the discrete equation, I would really like to show you how to pick 
are zero for one particular example. Quasi minimizers are a little bit tricky, so let's do it. Although my motivation was all here, uh, let's do the computation. For this one, I can really show you the computation. So let's see it, because otherwise it's not clear what's happening. So here is my computation for the discrete equation. I'm taking the easiest possible discrete equation that I can take, where the second uh, discrete differences are computing along the axis, so only in the i direction. So these are my second discrete derivatives. Okay. So I have this equation with uh, coefficients which are uniformly bounded by something which I'm calling lambda min and lambda max. And I'm saying that I can apply our theorem to conclude that solutions will be older continuous once I step a little bit inside with universal modulus of continuity. And what I want to show you is how do I pick these guys? The lambda, which you should imagine should be related to this lambda min and lambda max because I claimed that lambda is what gives the electricity of the problem, right? R0 and this n. So here is like the explicit computation in this very simple model case. So I want to find R0. I claim already from the beginning that R0 is 2 epsilon. I could have taken also 3 quarter and no, maybe not epsilon plus a little bit, but 2 epsilon is nicer and it's, I'm thinking of more general discrete equation. So I'm claiming that 2 epsilon is going to be the size R0. So let's say that at 0, I assume that I do have a polynomial which touches my function u at zero in the full ball of size R0, okay? And what happens then? Well, these are discrete differences. I'm writing them out and I say u is on top of p. u is on top of p. The, way, the place where u is evaluated is inside the ball of radius 2 epsilon where u is on top of p. So u is on top of p, u is on top of p, u0 and p0 are the same because they touch a zero. So the second discrete differences of u are on top of the second discrete differences of p. So the full L is on top of u is on top of the L of p. But L of u, since u is a solution to my discrete equation, is zero. So this guy should be smaller or equal than zero. But now I take this guy explicit, I plug it inside, I compute the discrete differences for this explicit function, I obtain this object, I think you can do the computation and you can trust me, okay? And clearly you can see that if I take this lambda large enough, because the lambda i's are trapped between lambda min and lambda max, if I take lambda large, I can force this quantity to be positive and I've reached a contradiction. And so that's where the lambda comes from, okay? The second property, now here is my disclaimer, I mean, I'm writing some density estimate in the general uh, setting. Here, because I have a discrete model, really what I need is something that holds everywhere in this case. And the definition that I gave you of these functions that satisfy this two-scale behavior, for each different problem has to be modified a little bit to fit your problem. Oh, sorry. I have to out, uh, yes. So, well, I chose it to be 2 epsilon, I could have chosen anything so to make sure that this guy here is on top of this and I know that I have control. Now, so a little bit bigger than epsilon would have been enough, but in gen this is because I'm moving along the EI direction. If I had a more general discrete equation, probably I would need a little bit more room and 2 epsilon would do for the general case. So for these guys, so where I want something now really to hold everywhere, so the property that I have to verify is that if at one point I drop below, I'm taking a to be one, I'm dropping below one, in a full neighborhood, I really have to drop below one in the full neighborhood, I mean point-wise, because I have a discrete setting. So I say, okay, let me use again the equation. I know that L of u is zero at zero, let me plug it in, and now I use that u is positive, and that at one point drops below one, so minus two, this should be a two actually, is bigger than minus two, so very simple-minded, I have this bound, which tells me that the value of u at epsilon ei is controlled by some constant, let me not write explicitly, okay? But if I now do this in a neighborhood of size, let's say k, I obtain that in the full neighborhood u is controlled by a constant. 
how big a neighborhood do I want be to have the two scale behavior? I want a neighborhood of size comparable to R0. And how comparable how? With the constant that depends on lambda that comes from the Harnack inequality. So I'm, I'm going to choose this constant so that my Harnack inequality applies. And this constant is going to tell me how much u has dropped. So it's going to tell me it's going to tell me what m is. So that's why I told you in the applications in reality, the m comes out of your problem. The lambda comes out of the problem, but the m depends on lambda most generally. Okay. So this is the only reason. So I have five minutes. So I doubt that I can give you the proof for quasi minimizers. So I had it. I have here just out of curiosity. I just tell you since I, this is a, the boundary of a set. What do I mean by this touching right property? And so I have here what the property that I would like to prove in this setting is that the boundary of E cannot be touched by something nice, xn equals a quadratic polynomial. So my lambda in this case is 2n. That's what it is. Okay. And the size of the neighborhood, I mean, the, the, gap, the interesting thing in this notion is what, what I really matter about is I have a, a, the, the size rho of the neighborhood where the touching cannot occur depends on the test function. So that's the type of uh, notion of viscosity solution that I have in this setting. That the neighborhood where I don't want the touching actually depends on the function that I don't want to touch my boundary with. So it's rather intricate. So I'll just go. Yes, Robin, sorry. So So I have a picture, why don't so I have the set okay. and so I have outside of the set? Yes, the that's yeah, that's so it's a kind of a bad term, but that's what I mean. Really the this this is the good so this is what I don't want. I mean right here. Okay, so this I was ambitious, I wrote also how to show you the thing. Of course I have to use variational uh, uh, tools because the problem is variational. I can't do anything else but just create competitors and use the quasi minimality to make sure that this property does not happen. But once that I show that this property does not happen, then the viscosity thing kicks in, the viscosity approach kicks in, and I have Harnack inequality from a viscosity point of view. So I had this beautiful picture, but forget about the whole proof. I don't know if there was anything else that I wanted to tell you. Very, very ambitious. Uh, mm, even integration by parts and everything. So that's it. The only thing maybe that I wanted to say is the second property. The second property is a little tricky and really holds basically when we are in the flatness regime. Remember, I want to apply this to prove that a flat quasi minimizer is going to be smooth. So if I put myself in the flatness regime, so the scale of the neighborhood is really given by your flatness. That's what this, so the epsilon zero, the, sorry, R zero, in this case, you do not see it so much in the touching. It does, in the touching, what you see is the fact that the size of the neighborhood depends on your comparison functions. But the R0, you see it basically in the second property when you're trying to prove this sort of density, let's say. And it has to be given, it's given to you by the flatness regime. That's what gives you the R0. It's a little bit complicated, so I can't say much. Let's see if I had, I had some further applications that I thought Tatiana would love. I mean, so I just put them down. I mean, there are applications to free boundary problems, but I don't really don't have the time. I mean, Tatiana has some beautiful results and contributions. She can teach you more about this in this, um, in this direction. And so I, I don't have time to tell you any of this. Our purpose for looking at this was mostly motivated by non-local free boundary problems. So even more complicated and I don't have time. The only time I have time for is to tell you thank you. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs>